Okay, I think we can get started here. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to all the members of the public uh, who have joined us today for your interest in our agency and our work. I hope that everyone is healthy and safe. I particularly wanna thank the board staff for their adapt adaptability and their resilience in continuing to carry on our mission during the COVID-19 pandemic under circumstances that are obviously challenging for so many in our society. Uh, our agency's mission is to ensure that the government's efforts to combat terrorism are appropriately balanced with privacy and civil liberties. One of the most important counterterrorism tools, as, as many know here, is FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. Our board has looked in the past at many aspects of FISA. Most recently, earlier this year, we published a report on the collection of telephone call detail records by the NSA from American carriers. Recent events have now put FISA in the, in the news again. The Department of Justice Inspector General found serious errors in the use of Title I of FISA, which governs wiretapping for national security purposes, including counterterrorism inside the United States. In addition, several other important pieces of FISA expired in March when Congress could not reach an agreement to reauthorize them, and those remain expired as of this date. Our panelists today are highly regarded experts on surveillance and civil liberties and civil rights. We've invited them to help us consider how this very important law could potentially better achieve both of its important goals, obviously protecting national security, but of course safeguarding Americans' fundamental rights and privacy as well. A final quick word about our format. This is our agency's first virtual public forum. Like many government agencies, we're learning on the fly how to use technology to cope with the limitations imposed by the pandemic. We know that people's time and attention are limited in this format, so this will be shorter than one of our in-person events typically is. Uh, the event will be recorded and will be posted on our website uh, so people can watch it later if they weren't able to attend. We've also solicited written input from a much larger group of experts in surveillance and civil rights, uh, and we will post their submissions on our website as those come in later this summer for the public to read. Let's get right to our first panel, which includes two former leaders of the National Security Division of the Department of Justice, which is something of a quarterback within the executive branch for the use of FISA and for interactions with the court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that approves FISA applications. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep introductions very brief. These are very accomplished people, so I could be reading all day if I were to go through the full bios. Uh, in 2006, Ken Weinstein was confirmed by the Senate to be the first Assistant Attorney General for National Security. In that role, he established the Justice Department's National Security Division. He's also served as General Counsel of the FBI and as Homeland Security Advisor in the White House, among many other roles. He's now a partner at the law firm of Davis Polk. Mary McCord served as Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security and as a Principal Deputy in the National Security Division. Before that, she spent two decades in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., which handles many national security investigations. She's currently legal director at Georgetown University's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. So we have two real experts who work with this statute uh, on the inside of the government. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, your opening statement, please. Okay, thanks, Adam. And um, good to be here, and good to be here with uh, old friends. And, uh, and colleagues who've, uh, and we've spent a lot of time talking about these issues over the years. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to do it again. So uh, as, um, as I thought about it, I thought maybe what I would do is I'd sort of try to provide a little bit of a historical perspective, which given the fact that I'm the old guy in the group and I've lived the history, it probably makes sense. Um, but it, it really, I think it's important if we're trying to figure out what's happening today is to look back at what happened in the past and how we've gotten here. And just to give a quick overview, FISA, I think, as most of you are aware, passed in 1978. And the important thing is that FISA from the very beginning has been a balancing. Um, it was a balancing of national security interests versus civil liberties and privacy interests from the very beginning. And um, you see that in the way the statute was passed. It was not constitutionally required. It's something that the, or at least arguably not constitutionally required. It's something that the Carter administration agreed to, to go along with and, and join with Congress in passing it. Um, because of the abuses that had been exposed by the church committee and others. Um, and it, um, you know, from the, it's, its very essence is a balance in the sense that you look at, you know, how it's designed to apply. It applies in situations where Fourth Amendment interest, U.S. person interest, and U.S. contact 
is uh, is most um, most evident, and it doesn't apply when you're talking about non-U.S. persons overseas more generally. Um, its standards are uh, determined by whether it relates the surveillance that is to be conducted relates to a U.S. person or is going to happen in the U.S. The higher standards apply in that situation, lesser standards apply the farther you get away from the U.S. and the U.S. person. So the idea was that, that Congress tried to balance this so that it was focused on protecting core Fourth Amendment interests um, involving U.S. people, U.S. persons, and the U.S. So that balance was struck in 1978, and then it's been rebalanced numerous times since then. Just to tick off the times that has been rebalanced, of course, you have the Patriot Act and the uh, and ERPTA that was passed in 2004, Patriot Act in 2001, right after 9-11, um, provided for roving wiretaps that we're you know, discussing today, as well as the enhanced business records uh, section. Um, and then that all played out in 2001 and then 2004. And then there's the Patriot Act reauthorization, which went back. And you know, given that the Patriot Act was sort of rushed out after 9-11, it went back and took an appropriate, Congress took an appropriate uh, look back at what had been passed and then added a number of different safeguards and additional oversight. And that resulted in the Patriot Act reauthorization statute of 2006. And then you know, along the way, there was rebalancing in terms of its implementation. Um, along the lines of you know dealing with screw-ups um, like we've seen and we'll talk about here with the, the Carter Page situation you know we had the national security letter um, uh, problems back in 2007 that resulted in changes with the national security division the uh, initiation of uh, compliance reviews of the of FISA's and FISA operations and sort of tighter oversight within the FBI and DOJ and then in terms of the, what I guess I'd call the mother of all rebalancing was the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, which addressed changing technology since 1978 and the impact that was having on the statute and its application and allowed for a programmatic review involving nine U.S. persons overseas. Um, and then also just thanks to the various sunset provisions that have been in place um, on these various new provisions, every few years we've had had a forced rebalancing as we've had to go back and debate these provisions for the reauthorization in the years. So we've had this, this constant process of rebalancing and recalibration. And throughout that process, it's largely been a balancing of national security interests versus civil liberties and privacy interests. And it's been Liza Goitin and Ken testifying, um, taking opposite points of, of opposite views on an, on an issue countless times. And it hasn't even been necessarily Democrats versus Republicans. I mean, you have people in both parties taking different views of these issues. Uh, I, you know, one of my best allies with the FISA Amendments Act was Sheldon Whitehouse, who understood the need both to protect U.S. persons overseas, but also the need for this, this authority. So it hasn't really been a DR thing. Rather, I think the, the debates have been waged on principles, largely, principles of national security and privacy, and not on politics. And the problem with today's reauthorization is that we now have politics blatantly sort of being injected into the process, and that's making it more difficult to come to a consensus. Um, and that's a result of the Carter, Carter Page FISA issues that we're going to talk about today. And then the battle lines have been drawn over the Russian investigation and, and whether those should be, uh, you know, people's concerns about those should sort of be taken out in the context of the reauthorization debate. And as a result, you have three provisions that are pretty important that are just being held hostage and are now have actually expired because uh, of this the political um, the politicization of this national security debate, which is bad policy and bad government. And um, you know, look, there are serious concerns that were highlighted by what the IG has found in his two works, the um, the report as well as the the audit. And you know, the, no question, reforms are needed. Um, we need to look hard at making sure those kind of problems don't recur in the future, but these are two different issues. The provisions that, were, were, that Congress should be reauthorizing um, were not affected by, have nothing to do with the um, alleged abuses or concerns that came up in the context of the Carter Page FISA and the IG's work. So um, I believe, as well as many others, that we need to get back to just focusing on the balance, looking at the, these provisions that are up for reauthorization based on that balancing, and pass the reauthorization and then have a separate reform package that addresses the concerns
um, that people have had over the last year based on the IG's findings. And once we do that, then I think we'll be looking at this to the right lens, which is that balancing lens of national security versus civil liberties and privacy. Okay, thanks, Adam. That was great, thank you, Ms. McCord. Sorry about that, I had to unmute myself. Um, thanks for having me here. I um, concur with what Adam already said in his opening that FISA is really a critical tool for combating terrorism and other national security threats. Um, you know, I saw in my own experience that without it, we would have had a much more difficult time. Those, those charged with keeping Americans safe and protecting America's critical infrastructure would have had a much more difficult time. But that said, we have to recognize, as Ken just also reflected on, that even though the purpose of FISA is to gather foreign intelligence, that implicates US persons. And um, nevertheless, we have a different standard for a FISA surveillance than we have for other domestic surveillance that is for criminal law enforcement purposes. And that's appropriate and that's constitutional, but it means that it's even all that more important that the standards and the pr procedures for obtaining FISA surveillance um, must be scrupulously adhered to. Um, the credibility of the FBI and the Department of Justice and uh, the national security and intelligence professionals in this country before the FISA court uh, and in front of the American public is critical to having faith that civil rights and civil liberties are not being trampled upon and that what is what the government is doing as Ken indicated in this balance is that it's doing what it needs to do for national security but not going further than that and so what I think we've learned from these last two OIG reports the December extensive report and then the April a much smaller sort of um, initial results of, a, of an initial audit is what I what I have been referring to actually as the FISA Brady moment. Um, and by Brady, I'm referring to a Supreme Court case from the 1960s called Brady v. Maryland. And most of my career has been as a federal prosecutor. And so this is a case that is uh, well known to every prosecutor around the country because it's a case where the Supreme Court said that due process requires that the prosecutors provide to criminal defendants information that is material and that would either exculpate them or be impeaching. And by that, it means tend to suggest that someone else or tends to suggest that the person being charged did not actually commit a crime or tends to undermine the credibility of any information or evidence against the person charged. That's what's meant by exculpatory and impeaching. And the, this case law and this constitutional principle has been around for um, decades, as I indicated, the case dates back to the 1960s, but how it's been implemented by uh, prosecutors has really varied over the years because in some ways determining what is material, what's material exculpatory evidence, what's material impeaching evidence is not always known to a prosecutor who doesn't necessarily know what the defense will be. Nevertheless, prosecutors have been obligated not only to provide information to the defendant, but to provide it to the courts as well when they're seeking a search warrant, for example. If, they, if they're putting on information to suggest probable cause for a warrant, they're also obligated to, put on, to, to provide the court with the information that might tend to undermine that other probable cause information. And so the Department of Justice hit its Brady moment after the ten, Ted Stevens prosecution when it was revealed that um, prosecutors had withheld important material evidence that tended to suggest that Senator Stevens did not commit the crime he was charged with. And that caused an entire paradigm shift within the Department of Justice. More than just box checking, more than just new sort of procedures, but you know, more than just training, which happened, mandatory training yearly, more than just reports to the courts, but it brought scrutiny by courts, really, really digging in and ensuring that prosecutors were providing this information. And it brought public scrutiny as well. And that drove a culture shift and it drove a culture shift to providing, taking a broad view of materiality um, and basically turning over to the court or to the defendant any information, whether it was admissible it itself or could potentially lead to admissible 
evidence, information that tended to undermine the prosecution. So when I say this is a Brady movement for FISA, I'm referring to the fact that there was information that's been revealed um, that should have been in FISA applications, but was not, and was not because it was not elevated up to the Department of Justice attorneys who were responsible for getting that uh, application over to the FISA court. I'm also seeing it because we know from the March report that the Woods procedures, these are procedures that are designed to ensure the accuracy of all the information in FISA applications, these Woods procedures have not been being complied with on a regular basis. Now we don't know whether the non-compliance is material or not material, but this type of paradigm shift in the way that the FBI and the Department of Justice attorneys in the National Security Division need to be looking at exculpatory and impeaching information and including it in FISA applications. This culture shift that occurred in criminal prosecution needs to occur now in, uh, in the FISA process. And I think we're gonna see that not just from the types of reforms that Director Ray has already agreed to and, and hopefully has begun implementing, but we're gonna see it coming from the FISA court demanding more accountability, personal accountability from um, Department of Justice lawyers and FBI agents. And I think, I think we are going to see it, we should see it from the Department of Justice lawyers demanding more from the FBI. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just start, get us started with a first question and then uh, invite uh, other board members to ask some questions. Many of the reform proposals that are on the table um, focus on adding additional procedural protections uh, based on the status of the target. So for example, whether the target is a US citizen or whether the investigation falls into one of the categories of sensitive investigative matters used by, by DOJ. Uh, so for example, religious leaders or journalists or people involved in political activities. Uh, I'd be interested in your views on, on specific proposals that are out there, but also whether that's a promising uh, approach, potentially being more specific in the statute about the different types of protections that are assigned to different classes of targets uh, based on the level of sensitivity and the level of concern that we would have. And I'll also note to that end that that there is a wide range of, of different types of targets covered by the statute, including things that are obviously foreign powers or agents of the foreign powers, going all the way to US citizens where their status as an agent of a foreign power is indeed uh, uncertain and, and that's part of the purpose of the application is to confirm mm -hmm. it. Um, I, you go ahead. Can, sure. Um, so I, I'm not familiar with necessarily every specific proposal that's out there. I know there's been a lot of things floating around. I think that um, I think probably most people who are tuning in realize that there is a provision of, of FISA that makes clear that um, probable cause cannot be based solely on First Amendment protected activities. That exists in FISA. It also exists in, more generally in, in opening criminal investigations. Um, and so the question is, is that you know, is that directive, that, you know, piece of the statute being effectively implemented? And I, and I think that's partly gets to your raising the idea of different types of U.S. persons having potentially different scrutiny applied to those applications. I, I don't know that we necessarily need different types of scrutiny applied depending on who the target is. But I think it's critical because, you know, no matter who the U.S. person is, the same standards, you know, really should be applying in terms of not basing it on First Amendment protected activity and ensuring that there really is probable cause that the person is an agent of, of a foreign power as that's defined in the statute. Um, and so the question in my mind is what, you know, ensuring that all relevant information um, is provided in the application to the FISA court so the FISA court can make sure to make that assessment is, you know, the assessment about whether probable cause has been established, particularly considering the unique situation that whoever the target, it, you know, might be is, and whether that particular target implicates First Amendment or other concerns. You want me to take a crack at it, Adam? Sure. Okay, so look, the, the general principle that if we're gonna put safeguards in the statute, that maybe they should be on a sliding scale based on whether we're dealing with a US person or a non-US person, whether they're dealing with 
conduct, you know, surveillance conduct in the U.S. versus outside the U.S. That's consistent with, as I said in my opening remarks, consistent with the way FISA was designed with the notion that, look, FISA is focusing on U.S. persons. Main protections are for U.S. persons. Um, you know, there's, uh, and so that makes sense without sort of talking about any particular safeguard or particular reform. That makes sense. The, the one concern that I think might, this is maybe building on what Mary said, there's a, a good bit of um, precedent in the Justice Department for providing extra scrutiny to particularly sensitive matters. So if you want to have a, an undercover go into a, you know, a religious organization or a political organization, there's additional internal um, scrutiny and steps that need you, you need to go through in order to get approval to do that. And so that's been the way that has been dealt with typically in the past, that there's been a, you know, there's a recognition that they, the rules are the same for everybody as they are laid out in the statute. But as a practical matter, we're going to make sure that in those, when we're applying those rules in particularly sensitive areas, there's higher level scrutiny. And look, we've, you know, the Patriot Act, for instance, has higher level scrutiny in the NSLs for, and I think maybe in business records for, you know, um, gun records and library records and stuff. So it could be put into statute, but oftentimes it's actually internal. And I think one example is, I know Attorney General Barr early on announced that he felt that um, there should be AG sign off before there's an investigation of a presidential campaign or candidate or whatever. And I guess that was one of the provisions in one of the um, proposed bills. And, you know, whether that's in, in the bill or, you know, just a, as a matter of process within DOJ, it makes sense to me, given the, the, the magnitude of that decision. Um, but I'm not sure that these things all need to be put into statute. Sometimes it's cleaner for the statute to lay out the rules as they apply to everybody in each category, U.S. person, non-U.S. person, and then through oversight, make sure that DOJ and the FBI have the necessary mechanisms that they're looking at those particularly sensitive cases to make sure they don't go outside the lines. Thank you. Board Member Felton has the next question. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask a very uh, sort of general and broad question about the role of the PCLOB specifically on this issue. FISA and FISA reform are large, sometimes noisy topics, but in light of uh, PCLOB's um, mission related to counterterrorism and um, specifically around um, overseeing the uh, appropriate um, balance or incorporation of privacy and civil liberties into these programs, um, and in light of what you know about who we are and uh, our resources and how we operate, what advice might you give to us about how we can be most useful and effective in, um, uh, in the FISA space? Mary, you want to go ahead? So you start this time. I went first. Okay, time. only fair. Um, look, I've actually found that the PCLAB has been, um, has been a force for good. And, um, and partly these kind of public um, aura, I guess, the right word, and I've testified in a couple of them over the years have been very effective, very, very helpful at just sort of uh, enhancing public awareness and sensitivity to these issues. Reports obviously have been very good, but to tell you the truth, where I found it to be really effective was actually just, you know, the, the, the sessions where you came in and said, hey, brief us on this, brief us on that. And then ask the tough questions because you know the PCLAB is a collection of smart people who have a variety of experiences who've thought about these issues, and I found that was actually very valuable um, in the sense that you know it a I had to be prepared for those tough questions and just and that's of course the ABCs of oversight right you you ask tough questions that's going to get the government person thinking about those tough questions and hopefully there's going to be programmatic changes to make sure that he or she can answer those questions effectively. And I, I found it was, a, it was a sort of a, a lower pressure, but in some ways more effective kind of oversight when I worked with you guys, as opposed to getting, you know, tramped up to the hill and getting beat about the head with sound bites. So I would recommend those kind of sessions. Thanks. Yeah, so I, um, I think one of the things that's been so valuable about P Club's work has been sort of the transparency it's brought to programs that I think most of the American public are, are pretty clueless about. Now that of course assumes that 
members of the American public are, are tuning in and paying attention and reading the reports, or at least reading, let's be honest, most are probably not going to read the lengthy reports, but reading news reporting about the reports, um, I think has, you know, brought attention, and part of this attention came as a result of various leaks, of course, that, that drove attention, but I think the P Club work then has been really important in, in, in showing the American public, like, we, we are concerned about transparency and civil liberties and privacy interests, and so we're going to take a deep dive from a bipartisan point of view, write a report that everybody can learn from. Um, and I think a lot of people, it also has been helpful, I think, in sort of disposing of misinformation and mythology about what some of the various surveillance programs and intelligence collection programs are that I think were widely misunderstood. Um, with respect to FISA, I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's an area that I think uh, P Club's work could be very helpful in. I mean, there is a lot going on right now, at least with respect to uh, Title I and what has come out of the OIG review of the Carter Page affidavit, uh, uh, Carter Page FISA, and you know, OIG is in the middle of an ongoing audit, and we've seen from its work they do a very, very thorough report. And so, I, I you know, I don't know that there's, uh, I don't know that it's worth sort of trying to reinvent that wheel or redo the same types of things, right, that OIG is doing, but I think perhaps using the work of OIG, including the work that is yet to come, and to look at it through your lens as opposed to the Inspector General lens, focusing on privacy and civil liberty, transparency, et cetera, and particularly seeing whether some of the reforms that already um, the FBI is implementing, DOJ is implementing, that the court will no doubt be requiring, give that a little bit of time and then take a deep dive, makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question um, for this panel, if any of the other board members uh, would like to weigh in. Yes, I'd like to weigh in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary and Ken, for joining us today. We appreciate uh, the information that you've shared with us. Um, I'll be quick with my questions uh, so that uh, you both have a chance to respond. Uh, Ken, I'm wondering if you can comment on what were the Carter Page FISA issues that you were referring to. My understanding is that they're being reviewed uh, by the Office of Inspector General, by, by the FBI, by NSD, by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and by Congress. I'm wondering if you could uh, share who's reviewing them. And just given how partisan you said all of that was, you know, would the P Club doing a re-review of those issues um, be of any use? And to Mary, um, you know, I uh, I have recommended to my colleagues that uh, we consider a project that would look at a statutory mandate requiring the inclusion of exculpatory information in FISA applications, as you have discussed. Um, you've also written a lot about domestic terrorism, and I'm wondering if you could tell us about domestic terrorism, and in particular, the distinctions in the surveillance tools that the government has available to it for domestic terrorism versus uh, foreign terrorism, and what do you think the P Club should be thinking about with regard to domestic terrorism? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, whoops, are you guys still there? I lost you. Are you still hearing me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, all right, I lost you somehow. Um, so, um, there we go. I think that's, that's a good question about um, sort of how the P Club, or for that matter, any entity that has a role in this, this issue and debating this issue, overseeing this issue, um, how you go about doing it. And I, what I do is I go back to my earlier comments. Uh, you're right, I'm bemoaning the politicization of national security. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be naive enough to think that national security is not a political issue. It is a political issue. It's a, you know, ever since 9-11, it's been a very hot political issue, always is. However, I've seen the, you know, conscientious parties, both on Capitol Hill and throughout DC, have focused on these issues in a nonpartisan way in the past. And that's, I've, I've really enjoyed that. It's one of the reasons I love working in this field because, you know, you sort of, we sit down with a member of Congress or staff or other folks, you know, Eliza, Mary, you just sort of park politics at the door. It's all about what makes sense for that balancing. And so if a group like this 
undertakes to review um, you know, the possibility of reforms for FISA and does so without falling into the trap of talking politics. I mean, there, there are reform ideas that have been generated by the Carter Page issues, no question about it. If, if you were to weigh in with, in, into the debate about what those reforms should be, what strike the best, which reforms strike the best balance between national security and privacy and civil liberties, then that's a, a net, you know, that's an added value. If you were to jump in and, and engage in a way that just sort of continues to hyper politicize the issue, then you're actually detracting from the debate. So I, I agree that that's a concern for any entity that's going to jump into this issue. Um, my experience with the P Club, though, in the past has been it's largely pursued issues uh, in the former way, in a conscientious, constructive way. And that's why I've always enjoyed working with the P Club. Thanks. Thanks for ans asking the question about domestic terrorism, because I think there is a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of focus right now on domestic terrorism. We've seen, you know, more, uh, more lethality from domestic terrorism incidents in the last several years than uh, from international terrorism incidents here in the homeland. And there's a lot of different um, discussions going on about how to address that. And um, I have, you know, one thing I've advocated for is a statute that would di more directly criminalize acts of domestic terrorism. But one thing I've also tried to be very clear about is a couple of things. One, that um, this doesn't mean that FISA tools would be opened up to criminal investigations of domestic terrorism because FISA is about collecting foreign intelligence, not domestic intelligence. And so I think sometimes when people hear, certainly not anybody on, on, on this panel or on the Peak Club, but when members of the public hear about terrorism, they immediately think, well, any new authority means FISAs, and that's bad because that's a different level of probable cause. But you know, any criminal authorities that would be used to investigate domestic terrorism would have to comply with all of the criminal legal process, Rule 41, search warrants, Title III wiretaps, all of the types of things that the Fourth Amendment and, and statutory law require. Um, and so those things shouldn't be confused. The second thing that's really important is that, um, you know, the risks, of course, when we're talking about investigating domestic activity, particularly domestic uh, terrorism, the risk of abusing those authorities to direct investigations toward individuals and groups based on First Amendment act, protected activity is, I think, even heightened um, above even what it is with respect to investigating international terrorism. So any kind of efforts that um, Congress might undertake potentially to create new statutory authority would have to include really significant oversight to ensure that the tools weren't misused that way. The, any, any law enforcement authority needs to be put toward the, the threat. And we know what the threat is right now. In fact, Director Ray has been clear that the threat, the domestic terror threat is at the same uh, level of intensity and importance as the international terrorism threat. And that's why they're now putting resources toward it. So ensuring that by, you know, congressional review of the investigations opened up, and I don't mean by target, but like by category of, of type of investigation, you know, white racially motivated violence, animal extremism, anarchist violence. Where is the Bureau putting its resources and does that, do those resources, are they commensurate with the actual threat, which right now is from, you know, far right wing extremism, but any extremism is bad. It's just, you know, directing resources to the appropriate place. And this is where I think Peak Club could be important if there were more focus, whether it's through a domestic terrorism statute or just through other focusing of um, resources, funding, agent time, et cetera, to the, the domestic terrorism threat. I think that's something that it would be important for the for P Club to take a, a deep dive into after a year or two years, you know, enough time to to have a body of information to look at and do that kind of soup to nuts review that, that you all have done in the past to make sure that privacy and civil liberties are being protected even while the government, you know, uh, aggressively tries to pursue and thwart domestic terrorist plots. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and uh, we were grateful to have you come and talk to our staff about some of those domestic terrorism issues, and, and we are tracking that issue as the government ramps up its efforts to combat what is obviously a very significant threat to public safety in the United States. Uh, Board Member Bamzai has the last question for this panel, and then we'll move on to the next group. Thanks so much, Mary and Ken, for being here. Um, I, I have a relatively open-ended question that's directed at either or both of you. Um, and um, I was just wondering, based on your experiences in government and with the FISA program, um, if you have any reform proposals that you, uh, you recommend or, or that you think that we should look at, or um, if there are any reforms that you see currently being adopted or advocated that you think we and the public should pay the most attention to. Um, and, um, and I guess what, when I was listening to Mary's remarks, I, I was thinking through whether the reforms, uh, and Ken's remarks as well, whether the reforms should be statutory or internal, and uh, whether uh, the reforms should be directed to the design of the FISA program in some sense, or whether uh, we ought to look at compliance, and uh, if the government's complying with the rules that are already in place. It's a relatively open-ended question, but I wonder if uh, for our um, public over here, you, you could speak a bit to what reforms you think would make the most sense in this area. You want to start, Ken? Go ahead. Um, so I don't have specific proposals, and I've looked at some that are out there. Um, I will, and and some I'm struggling with. Like I do think that you know, and and again, almost everything I ever say comes from my lengthy experience on the on you know domestic criminal law enforcement and prosecution. And you know, we know from the way that system operates that adversarial you know, um, testing in before a court is, is one of the, you know, healthiest aspects of our democracy. And one of the struggles I have with the FISA pro process is it by and large is not an adversarial process. It's by and large the government uh, presenting its package to, to the court and the court making a decision without adversarial testing. Now, that is the same as it is at the search warrant or Title III stage also on the criminal side. So it's not like there's a huge divergence there, but ultimately on the criminal side, all of that does get revealed to a defendant in a criminal case. Um, and so, you know, I, I am certainly in favor of um, the FISA judges being able to appoint an amicus anytime they think it would be helpful. Right now it's, you know, limited to sort of novel situations. I'm not in favor of there being an amicus for every single FISA. I think that's unwieldy and, 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 and probably not practical. But I do think, I mean, the judges that do the work, they know when they, 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 they will know when they look at an application, I think, if they could, you know, benefit from amicus participation. And so I think at least giving them the ability to do that um, in a more expanded sense of what is currently available would be a helpful start. But otherwise, I still sort of struggle with what's the proper balance. I know we've also, um, we haven't talked about it yet in this panel, but you know, there's a question of when a criminal prosecution does end up involving some FISA-derived evidence, you know, are there enough pr pr protections for criminal defendants in those situations? Now, the vast majority of criminal cases don't rely on any FISA-derived information, and the vast majority of FISAs don't ever, you know, funnel in or produce anything that goes into a criminal case. They, they really are mostly separate, but there are those cases that they exist. And I think um, probably some more transparency in terms of how does the department think about what is FISA-derived uh, information for purposes of the notice that it does have to provide um, would, be, would be a healthy thing. Um, and, but I'm still, you know, I'm not sure where I fall in terms, I'm sure there are others, lies and others who may advocate for, you know, more, uh, more court orders revealing the FISA application to defense counsel so that they can test it by adversarial testing. That raises a lot of complicated and difficult national security issues. Um, and so I just, I haven't, I, I don't fully know where I come down on that, but I think these are important issues that we need to talk about and, and people just need to understand more what, what they mean. And, and so when I talk about transparency, a little bit of it is to like make sure people understand what we're talking about here, what the, what, what the law requires and give more thought to where adversarial testing would, you know, would be beneficial without harming 
national security. So good question. I just want to point out sort of two issues that you sort of raised there. One is, and this following on, Mary said, look, you know, there, there are various reforms and safeguards that have been put in place since 9-11. That's one of the reasons why I went through that chronology. And I can tell you that after 9-11, there's a certain sense within the Justice Department of being allergic to any kind of additional safeguards or oversight or anything because, you know, this is all about preventing the next wave of terrorist attacks. And then uh, the Patriot Act reauthorization came along, put some different safeguards, made, you know, required higher level approvals, this kind of thing. And, you know, we didn't lose the nimbleness that we were worried about losing. And, um, and it was sort of taught us that, hey, we can actually do this with a little bit more process. However, there is a tipping point where it becomes too difficult. And in these situations, especially in terrorism investigations, there's often a need for speed. And if you make it too difficult, and with the amicus issue, you know, you, you allow the amicus to be too involved and be able to, to um, sidetrack things, that could actually have a real impact on our national security. So that's a balance that needs to be struck. And when the government talks about that, that's a real concern. Um, that's one point I want to make. Second is what you were alluding to is that, look, a lot of these things can be, a lot, a lot of reforms can be effectuated without statutory change. And Congress likes to put something in law because it demonstrates that they've done something in response to a controversy, let's say. But a lot of this can actually be done through executive branch oversight, um, additional you know, limitations on themselves and oversight of themselves bolstered by congressional oversight and FISA court oversight. So you have the FISA court making sure that they are you know, being complete with their WITS procedures and that kind of thing. And so you can end up getting the reforms in place in practice without actually having to have legislation. So that is, um, and that's the way we've actually refined things significantly over the years internally with the executive branch. Um, and not just, you know, it's a trust but verify kind of thing. Congress still checks it and the court still checks it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it often, it's actually proven to be the most effective targeted way of implementing lessons that we've derived from various mistakes along the way. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's, that's all the time we have for our first panel, unfortunately, but thank you, thanks to both of you for joining us. You will have the opportunity, the option, but not the obligation to provide a written statement uh, to supplement your comments, comments today if you wish to. Our second panel includes two leading experts on national security law and civil liberties. Unfortunately, our third planned panelist, Andrew McCarthy, had a conflict arise at the last minute, but we'll look forward to receiving his written submission. Uh, again, I will keep the introduction short in the interest of time. Uh, Elizabeth Goitin co-directs the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Her research has examined the FISA court, secret law, overclassification, and many other related topics, and Congress very frequently seeks out her testimony on these issues. Professor Robert Chesney holds the James Baker Chair and serves as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Texas School of Law. He's also a co-founder of Lawfare and a co-host of the National Security Law Podcast. We'll start with Ms. Goitin. Thanks, Adam. Um, and I want to thank all the board members for inviting us here uh, to talk about the future of FISA, which is an issue that I spent much of the last 13 years uh, thinking about. The goal of FISA back in 1978 was to ensure the protection of Americans' constitutional freedoms when the government undertakes foreign intelligence surveillance. Um, and the basic idea, as Ken laid out, uh, and this is, of course, necessarily a bit of an oversimplification, but the idea was that the government, when it acts inside the United States, if it wants to collect communications involving a United States person, uh, it has to show probable cause to a court. And when it wants to collect communications um, between non-US persons, or if it is acting entirely, if it's acting outside the United States and not deliberately, targeting US persons, um, it can do so without judicial oversight. So that's the idea. Um, whatever merit this system had back then, changes in technology and the law have rendered it, I would argue, entirely inadequate to protect Americans' privacy today. Uh, and in fact, the legal framework for foreign intelligence collection has become a rich source of warrantless access to Americans' communications and other highly sensitive uh, personal information. First, Section 702 of FISA in 2008 
uh, removed the requirement of a probable cause order when collecting communications between U.S. persons and foreign targets overseas. Um, although the government is supposed to minimize the retention and use of the U.S. person part of the conversation, um, the actual minimization rules developed by the government and approved by the FISA court place very few limits on the government's access to Americans' information. Uh, and even those weak limits are frequently violated according to declassified FISA court opinions. This gets to some of these questions about internal rules versus law, um, some of the procedures that have been put in place in order to protect the privacy of Americans' information um, have been regularly um, violated in the sense that there's been a, a record of systemic non-compliance, not deliberate non-compliance. There's nothing nefarious about this, just a failure to adhere to, to those rules. Um, second, given the way digital data travels, the distinction between collection from outside the United States uh, versus collection that takes place in the United States no longer serves any meaningful function. Uh, today, purely domestic communications are routinely rooted or stored outside the United States. Uh, and while the law prohibits the deliberate targeting of a particular known U.S. person uh, uh, or the intentional acquisition of purely domestic communications uh, from overseas, it doesn't prohibit or prevent the mass acquisition of U.S. persons' communications without any judicial oversight. Third, FISA was expanded in 2001 to allow the government to collect any tangible thing other than communications content held by third parties uh, on a mere showing of relevance uh, to an investigation. Uh, in 2020, a huge amount of highly sensitive personal information is held by third parties. Um, this includes geolocation history, biometric data, web browsing and internet search information and more. But the Fourth Amendment case law, as always, is slow to catch up with technology and the government has not fully disclosed what types of information and it's getting and how, under what authorities. Finally, although the recent reports of, I'm sorry, through the recent reports of the Justice Department's Inspector General, um, we've learned what really should have been obvious all along. A secret court in which there is no adversarial testing of the government's evidence and no realistic prospect of adversarial testing down the line, as Mary pointed out, uh, leads to sloppy behavior on the part of the government. So for all of these reasons, I think there is an urgent need to rethink the entire FISA framework. And let me quickly say that I don't think a simple repeal of FISA is the answer. Uh, at least some administrations would interpret the legislative vacuum as permission to conduct foreign intelligence surveillance without any judicial oversight. But what I'm suggesting is replacing FISA with a legislative framework that better protects the privacy and civil liberties of US persons today. Uh, the P Club can play a vital role in laying the groundwork for such an effort. Um, and you can begin by obtaining and declassifying information in response to some key questions. Um, and this is a role and a service that the P Club has performed very well in the past. And I would point, for example, to the 2014 P Club report on Section 702. So here are some of those questions that need answers. Are FISA authorities used in a way that disproportionately targets racial, ethnic, or religious minorities or members of any other? marginalized group? Is First Amendment protected activity used as a justification by itself or in combination with other factors to engage in FISA collection? How often does this happen and in what contexts? What are all the different types of information that the government obtains under Section 215? Under its pen register trap and trace authorities, under its national security letter authorities? We don't know the answer to those questions. What is the government's best estimate of how many communications involving U.S. persons are collected each year under Section 702 of FISA? That is a question that lawmakers have been trying to get the answer to for, I think, about 10 years now. The Justice Department has refused to disclose its guidance on some important legal questions, including how it interprets the government's obligation to notify litigants when it uses evidence obtained or derived from FISA surveillance, and how it's applying the Supreme Court's decision in Carpenter. The PCOB should obtain and review that guidance and push for its declassification. Finally, I understand that the PCOB is issuing requests for additional information regarding the Title I applications reviewed by the DOJ Inspector General. Um, as others have said, I think the IG's investigation established conclusively 
the existence of significant accuracy and completeness problems with Title I applications. There's widespread bipartisan agreement that changes are needed to address that problem. Um, and the pending USA Freedom Reauthorization Bill um, has includes several such changes. Um, so given the limited time and resources available to the PCLOB, I would strongly recommend focusing your efforts on some of the other inquiries I've mentioned today, including other aspects of Title I. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Chesney. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to address three topics in this opening set of remarks. First, verification in Title I. Uh, second, Title I and the definition of agent of a foreign power. And then last, Section 215. So first, verification procedures in Title I. You know, we used to all think of this as the boring, uncontroversial part of FISA, but not so much anymore. Uh, in the wake of the, the IG two interventions, the Carter Page report and the, and the ongoing audit, um, there's the question of whether this process is vulnerable in specific cases to politicize misuse. Secondly, even if the answer to that is no, is there a more general problem of sloppiness, for want of a better word, in the verification system such that the FISC and, and for that matter, DOJ, National Security Division, can't trust as much as they should what FBI is putting for it? So again, the, the Carter Page report from the Inspector General did give reason to take these concerns very seriously. And uh, the follow-up report that, that's the interim report on, on the ongoing audit describes the sampling of 29 files that uh, show verification problems under the Woods procedures, uh, suggesting that maybe there really is a systematic sloppiness issue. But uh, just this past week, greatly complicating matters, National Security Division came forward to the FISC with its own assessment, answering a question that was not addressed by the Inspector General, which is whether those verification shortfallings in all those 29 files, uh, whether they actually concern material facts. Well, that's, that's a big question. Uh, National Security Division says they're about halfway done with their analysis. They've gone through 14 of the 29 files. It's an interim report. They found that of all the, the many different facts that were found not to have been verified properly, uh, almost all of them were immaterial. They were not material, except for one instance that they said also didn't affect the outcome in that particular case or wouldn't have. Now, to be sure, who knows what the second half of the review will show. And anyways, of course, there'll be many who won't credit NSD's analysis. They'll be looking to see what, what someone else might think about that analysis on materiality. Um, this perhaps points to a critical role for the PCLOB to play. Um, PCLOB is uniquely situated to contribute constructively with nuance, with credibility, to diagnose the real extent of the problem uh, and to advise us to solutions that could restore stability. And I wanna harken back here to what Ken said in his opening remarks. At the systemic level, the, the, the name of the game is to strike an evolving and refreshed balance of legitimacy for having foreign intelligence collection activities that touch US person privacy equities in an environment in which we are a free and open society, yet we also have to have these activities conducted to keep us safe. Um, and that, that's the critical task. We've got to get back to that stability. Um, there could be other possible reforms that are attractive. It might be worthwhile to entrench in statute some version, perhaps a more Brady-ified version, to borrow from Mary, of the Woods procedures on verification and disclosure. Uh, and it might also be wise to think about a process solution. If we think that the IG's intervention here has been useful, and I think it has, um, maybe the sort of sampling-based oversight of randomly selected samples, uh, maybe that ought to be par for the course and this ought to be happening on a rolling basis at all times. Uh, my second point about uh, the agent of a foreign power definition and the role it plays in Title I. First of all, I, I can't resist denouncing the suggestion that when we're talking about U.S. persons as potential agents of Russia, China, Iran, the Islamic State, et cetera, that somehow we should forbid resort to FISA. Um, there's been legislative proposals to, to knock this entire framework out as to U.S. persons. I, I think that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If there's protections that need to be added, they should be added. Um, but we don't want to blind our intelligence investigators to the activities of U.S. persons uh, who may be agents of foreign powers. This is hardly the time to do that. It's never the time to do that. Uh, at the same time, one size doesn't fit all, and I think it is interesting to think about whether in scenarios involving specially sensitive U.S. person categories, like elected officials, candidates for offices, key personnel associated with them, uh, then, then interventions to ensure 
that there is process. The sort of the sort of process that I think Director Ray has recently underscored that FBI is going to adopt as a matter of policy, we might want to see that codified, and that could help assuage concerns and restore legitimacy. Then, lastly, under this heading, the lone wolf scenario. Let's not forget that the lone wolf authority was created as a specific response to the all too real example of Zacharias Musawi. And yet it's been allowed to expire. And some say, well, there's, there's no harm because apparently it's never been used. That is actually an incredible statistic or non-statistic. It's, it's alarming and calls for some explanation given that we know that there's been a tremendous amount of Islamic State and Al-Qaeda inspired but not directed and controlled violent activity where you would think that the lone wolf provision, which is basically tailored for that scenario, would have been used recurringly in recent years. I think PCLOB should be looking closely at exactly this issue to find out what happened. Are those cases not arising? Is FISA not being used in such cases? If it is being used and lone wolf wasn't the category, does this suggest that there is perhaps a problematically broad understanding of what it means to be acting for or on behalf of a foreign terrorist organization, international terrorist organization. Uh, lastly and quickly about section 215. I know the board knows it, but there are a lot of people watching, I hope. Um, section 215 was never just about bulk historic contact chaining attempts involving call detail records of everyone's phone calls. Uh, long before that became a use of it, a creative, shall we say, use of it, it was a way of compelling production of documents and information from third parties. And when Congress let it sunset, it didn't, it didn't just get rid of the call detail record stuff. It also scalped Section 215 in this ordinary document production or information production function, um, cutting it back to the way it was prior to 9-11, when its use was narrowly confined to just a, a small number of types of businesses, reflecting certain businesses that made sense for a particular 1990s terrorism investigation where car rental records and storage, uh, rental storage facility records mattered, that's all there is now. And, and I don't think anyone thinks that that actually is the optimal approach here. And of course, what's happened is that Section 215 uh, has been held hostage to other unrelated FISA type considerations and the larger unfortunate politics of this issue. Uh, and not only has it been held hostage, but now the hostage has been shot and it's defunct. PCLOB can play a very important role here, and this goes as well for roving wiretaps, which again is a hostage that was taken and has now been shot. PCLOB could determine what the operational effect is, what cost and resource and opportunity harms perhaps have been experienced by investigations as a result of the uh, authorities going away. Now, I don't doubt that FBI has found workarounds in some cases, but what's the delta between how that operates versus how it would have operated otherwise. And are there examples where, in fact, there was no workaround and, and some investigative equity wasn't addressed? Um, I think that's an especially important function PCLOB could take on. And I'll, I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, my colleague, board member Jane Nitza, has the first question for this panel. Great. Thank you, first off, to um, all four panelists. Everything is um, extremely informative, and, and we appreciate you joining us today. Um, I have two questions. I'll try to make them short. One's a general question, and one's more specific. So first, some commentators have argued that the existence of the FISC gives other oversight bodies, and specifically really Congress here, a degree of comfort with executive intelligence surveillance that it wouldn't otherwise have, and leads to a decrease in the rigor of Congress's oversight that is unwarranted. Um, so the idea being that Congress believes it can do less in this area by way of oversight because of its comfort that another body in here, a judicial body, is conducting rigorous oversight. And I just um, would be curious what your views are of this hypothesis. It's, it's obviously one that doesn't lend itself to easy testing. And then my second question is really a follow-up to Adisha's and uh, Mary's answer in the last panel. Um, so obviously with the FISC, you have a court that is approving warrants in a classified context with no expectation that there will be meaningful adversarial testing. And in light of these realities, I wonder if you two could speak to concrete steps that you think should be taken to ensure the candor and thoroughness that we you know, typically see in the criminal context. And in part here, I worry that some of the proposals such as increased audits or, or the types of audits that we have seen to date or amici participation might fall short insofar as it would seem difficult for those to capture errors of omissions in FISA applications, at least absent the expenditure of uh, quite a bit of resources to redo the agents, um, FBI agents work on those applications. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Liz. Sure, um, I'll jump in on, on, I guess, your first question, uh, which is uh, whether or not the, the existence of the FISA court gives co Congress false comfort. Yes and no. I mean, I do think that sometimes um, the existence of, when Congress checks certain procedural boxes, when they require an IG report, when they require reporting to Congress, when they, in this case, task the FISA court with, with oversight, um, they feel like they've done enough and that they, can, they, and that they can step back a little bit and they mistake procedure, procedure for, um, for having come to the right substantive uh, decision about the law and the, and the policy. Um, and of course, oversight is not an end in itself. It's never an end in itself. Um, oversight is uh, a way to ensure that the rules are being followed, right? But if oversight doesn't lead to accountability, and if the rules themselves are not the right rules, all the oversight in the world is, is not going to help that much. Having said that, it's not that I think that if you took the FISA court away, you would have, Congress would be more involved, and you can test that hypothesis because you can look at Executive Order 12333 surveillance. Um, which does not have a FISA court or any other court um, overseeing those operations. And we've heard from lawmakers, including lawmakers on the intelligence com uh, committees, um, that there's extremely little uh, oversight within Congress of 12333 surveillance, certainly as compared to FISA surveillance. So I don't think the answer by any means is to get rid of the FISA court, but I would support the general sentiment that Congress needs to be more involved. Um, then on the question of candor and how to promote candor and uh, whether involving amiki is going to do the trick. I actually agree. I think uh, having amiki more involved would be helpful, but is not going to do the trick in some instances. I think there is no substitute for adversariality. And so that is why in terms of, in terms of enforcing and producing uh, candor and completeness. Um, so that is why I've advocated for expanding and reforming some of the notice provisions um, of FISA. Um, I've advocated for providing notice to targets of FISA surveillance after the investigation has closed. That's a compromise between the current situation, which is no notification, and the situation under the criminal law where the government has 90 days. Um, I've advocated that, uh, that, that Congress specify that obtained or derived from FISA really means what they say um, and doesn't permit sort of parallel construction and avoidance of notice requirements. Um, I think that uh, defendants should have access to FISA applications under the provisions of the Classified Information Procedures Act, SIPA, which, had, which works successfully in other kinds of litigation and other criminal cases. Um, what am I missing? Those are, the, <laughs> those are the main points, I think, in terms of ways to beef up notice, ways to beef up adversariality um, involving the party himself or herself, because you're right, amiki are not a substitute. I think, you know, amiki could not have looked at the applications in the Carter Page case and said, but wait a minute, Carter Page was a source for the FBI. That explained, that's not in here, you know, that, and that would explain some of these, these things. Carter Page would know that, right? So the, it's, it's not a perfect substitute by any means, even though it's an improvement. So these are great questions. On the first one, whether the existence of, a, of the FISC and the FISA process is, is in a sense giving Congress a free pass not to engage more rigorous oversight. Um, I think actually that's not the case at all. Um, if you go back to before 1978, um, where there was no FISC, you had even less congressional engagement. I think the four, I mean, none as far as it goes. I think that the uh, forces that determine what members of Congress decide to become invested in, in terms of oversight and performing those kinds of functions, as political scientists like Amy Zagart have, have well documented, um, they, they have a lot to do with what they are trying to maximize, uh, including re-election. Um, and it, I think it's got very little to do with these sort of institutional features. Uh, as for 12333, as perhaps a, a contemporaneous counterexample, I don't see it that way. I think that uh, Hipsy and Sissy have um, a central part of what they're doing. Uh, it's not visible to us because it's meant to be going on in a classified setting, but Title 50 oversight of collection activity under 12333 is, is uh, meat and potatoes activity going on constantly. It may not produce the results that, that some would like, but uh, I think a lot of it does in fact go on. Uh, as to the second issue about changes, I do want to associate myself with both our earlier panelists' comments, Mary's comment about the Brady concept. I think there's a lot to be said for entrenching in statute 
something along the lines of a Brady obligation uh, to compel that disclosure. And I say that precisely because I'm averse to extending a great deal of adversarial adversariality into this situation in light of the uh, offsetting concerns that Ken previously identified. I think in any event, a better first step is, let's see where we can get with uh, compulsory disclosure um, in a still not adversarial environment, but compulsory disclosure of exculpatory and impeachment information so that that obligation is more clear. I think we'll, we'll find that that uh, moves the needle quite a bit, actually. I'll stop there. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. I have a question uh, to the two panelists. If you were writing on a bank blank slate with respect to all of the activities that FISA covers, the domestic national security surveillance, Section 7, the activities that Section 702 covers, business records and other things, uh, what is the one big thing that you would do differently? And not sort of tinkering around the edges, more amicus here, more, less amicus there, but a big structural change uh, that you would that you would make to how we do things currently with, with respect to domestic national security surveillance. Avi, do you want to take that first? Sure, I'll, I'll throw out just two very high altitude ideas. Um, one is uh, that the elements of location based focus that, that try to pin uh, legal moving parts around where did the collection occur as opposed to who is the person whose information is at issue. I think that that very static and, and tangible world concept is a legacy of mid 20th century, third quarter of the 20th century thinking that's really problematic as applied to current communications technology. And so we should, if we were going from a blank slate, I can't imagine we put very much weight on that. Um, and uh, then I think we would put a lot, and this is sort of inspired by some stuff Liza said earlier, um, we, we do have all these incidental collection scenarios through 702 and 12333 where US persons are not the target, no one's trying to get their communications, but it's foreseeable that it ends up there. And I think having uh, much more systematic engagement and attention to how do we want to control which parts of government under which which procedures uh, can access that information uh, makes a lot of sense. And so those are two changes that if we were designing from the ground up, I think we'd build in as central features rather than, than uh, what we have currently. Uh, so I would, I think I would propose three things. Uh, the first thing is we need to rethink this idea that targeting somehow defines the Fourth Amendment rights that are involved in the communication and that who the government is interested in in the conversation is somehow determinative of the American's privacy right in that conversation. So, and Oren Kerr has written about this, that there actually is no concept of targeting in existing Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. It's sort of this uh, idea that's m m much more recent, but whether an American has a reasonable expectation of privacy in his or her communications with a foreigner overseas has nothing to do with who the government cares about. The American either has that interest or the American doesn't. And what we are seeing is that international communications uh, where both the foreigner and the American have equal privacy interests in that communications, it's the foreigner's level of, uh, of uh, legal protection that wins out and that's lower than the Americans. And so the Americans legal protections are diminished by virtue of being in contact with a foreign target. Um, I personally think and that that is um, not a correct reading of the Fourth Amendment, but let's say it were, I still think that it is not adequately protective of Americans privacy. So I think that's something that needs to fundamentally be rethought. Um, the second thing I would propose is that foreign intelligence surveillance today has not grappled with the Carpenter decision. And there are so many types of incredibly sensitive personal information. And I mentioned some of them earlier, things like biometric data, DNA, um, web browsing history that are available. And this is true under the criminal law as well, I should say, um, under, under a low relevant standard um, when really they are deserving of warrant protection. And so that is something that I think needs to be fundamentally rethought. Of course, the Supreme Court can't decide in terms of other types of information, other types of technology, or the, the Supreme Court can't decide it until a case comes before it. So we'll have to wait until then to see how the Supreme Court applies Carpenter in other contexts. 
Congress can't and shouldn't wait for those decisions. Congress has the obligation right now to try to decide how Carpenter should apply to other kinds of information, and Congress isn't really doing that. Um, and then the third thing I would say is that, as I said earlier, it makes no sense to carve out overseas surveillance entirely from the FISA framework unless, the, unless a particular known American is the target. Um, so much information about Americans is getting scooped up right now, sometimes with bulk collection uh, by virtue of overseas surveillance. Um, and so overseas surveillance that is likely to result in the collection of Americans' information needs to be brought under judicial supervision as well. Can I ask you a follow-up question to Ms. Goitin? You, you said, and I, I agree with this entirely, that Congress does not have to wait and Congress can act to apply different thresholds to different types of sensitive information. How would you do that? How would you define uh, the sensitivity of different types of information? I'll, I'll just cite one. One international example, in German law, there's this concept of the core area of personal dignity and privacy that deals with especially sensitive information about people's private lives, something like DNA might fall within that hypothetically. Uh, but do you have right. an idea of how Congress could legislatively uh, prescribe that? Yeah, I, I, it's very difficult. And I, I think it's been one of the issues that has sort of plagued um, the USA uh, reauthorization, so USA Freedom Reauthorization process is trying to figure out the way to address this. I think one way is for Congress to, start to figure out, to get answers, public answers, for the types of information that the government does obtain. And that makes it a lot easier to go through that information and makes it make a judgment call in each case as to whether or not um, this is the type of information. You can look through the Carpenter decision to sort of tease out the principles that this is information that a person sort of necessarily has to provide to a third party and doesn't really have a voluntary choice about doing that. That this is information that can reveal things about their beliefs and their associations, First Amendment protected uh, information, um, you know, that is of a highly sensitive nature. That this is information that can create a historical repository um, of a person's associations or movements. Um, so are there are a bunch of different factors that were articulated in the Carpenter decision um, that uh, Congress could look at and apply in terms of the actual types of information that the government is obtaining uh, under 215, under some of the other non-warrant authorities. Um, but first, we have to figure out what those are. And, and the government, has, as I said before, just has not disclosed whether it actually gets web browsing information, for example, using Section 215 or not. I'd like to jump in with a question um, here as we're getting close to the, to the end. And I want to thank Liza and Bobby uh, for joining us uh, as well, for, for all four panelists, actually. Your expertise precedes you. Um, I, I do hope that in the future, uh, as we have uh, forums or public events, that we can ensure that we have a little more diverse representation as well among the panelists that are participating. Um, I think that's important, particularly in an area where we're dealing with surveillance, which disproportionately impacts racial minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. I think it's important to hear from those communities as well when we're speaking. Um, you know, I think Bobby in particular in his remarks raised a number of interesting questions. The challenge I feel that we have as the board is we don't have unlimited resources. Uh, we're a fairly small agency. And so when we think about issues like materiality, which uh, the DOJ Inspector General is looking at in the course of an audit. They're just looking at whether or not there's a distinction between, you know, one document and another. It could be that the middle initial is missing. It could be that the birth date is one day off, and that constitutes an error. You know, my understanding, there were 700 applications that the uh, Inspector, Title I applications that the Inspector General identified in the last five years, and they're only looking at 29. Um, you know, I'm not sure that it's useful for us to look at the same 29 when there are 671 others that are out there. Um, you know, we could, you know, and when you have so many different agencies already looking at this, um, you know, we went through the list last time, including Congress and their changes being made. I can't help but wonder that if, if we were to look down Title I, it makes more sense to wait a couple years after those reforms have been in and then sort of look at them again. And so I guess what I wonder from you is if you only got, you know, we have a bunch of projects that are only going on, that are going on. We, we have room for one, maybe two FISA projects, nothing, nothing more than that. If you had to choose the two FISA issues 
for us to look at. Um, you know, would you would you choose to have us look at an issue that uh, has statutorily expired and that Congress is currently considering? Or would you have us look at some other issue? And maybe, you know, Bobby's with me and that the issue we should be looking at is a statutory mandate on the disclosure of exculpatory information and the extent to which that would help privacy and civil liberties. But I'm wondering if you just got one, what would it be? Hmm. Not two, eh? You can go with two. It's okay to share two. I will say, yeah, I mean, so you named my two. I think that, uh, I think that the, the disclosure issue and codification of building that into a codification of verification and all the rest makes a ton of sense. And, and that's a great project. Uh, I do think that I, I don't want to let section 215 uh, wither or lack for due attention. Cause I think there's really a unique ability of P club that was demonstrated with the earlier round with 215 and 702, the very unique and helpful work that was done by P club and describing how, 215 in practice was not yielding so much useful stuff, but 702 in practice was yielding very useful stuff. That sort of deeply informed, translated well, incredibly to the public work. Um, the current situation with 215 and revving wiretaps, unfortunately, seems to be crying out for, for that sort of attention as well. Now, it could be that Congress will get off its rear, put the politics aside, and do something here. But I can well imagine that many months from now, those are just sitting there continuing to not get attention and PCLOB could change that balance. So that's where I put my two chips down. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Bobby actually that section 215 is a very good authority to look at. I would disagree with him that you should be looking at the opportunity costs and, and how national security may be affected by the fact that section 215 has been allowed to lapse. Uh, that is the job of pretty much every other agency or every agency in the intelligence community. You are the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, the only independent body within government charged with looking at privacy and civil liberties. So you should be looking at the privacy and civil liberties impacts and effects of Section 215. And to that end, what I would encourage you to do is first of all, get answers from the government about what types of information it obtains. Does it get DNA from 23andMe, for example? Um, does it, what, what are the categories? Obviously, you can't make public specific cases and, and specific uh, information belonging to specific people, but you can uh, enlighten the public as to the categories of information, the complete list of, of those categories. And the other thing that I would look at is, the other couple of things on Section 215, is first of all, what has been the impact of dropping the requirement, which existed before 2001, that the subject of the records be a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. What I'd like to know is the records that are obtained today, what percentage of them is the subject of those records somebody who would not meet that standard, who is not suspected of being a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. I'd also like to get a little better information about some of the numbers we've seen in the ODNI reports suggesting that Section 215 is resulting in the collection of a, orders of magnitude, information relating to orders of magnitude, more people than the actual number of targets. How is that happening? That when we had, I think it was 60 targets in 2018, unique identifiers conveying information about more than 200,000 people were, were collected. So these are all questions that I think would be fascinating to explore in the Section 215 context. That's the first bucket. The second one, because I'm also going to take two, is um, to look at this question about disparate impact and whether or not the FISA authorities are being applied in a way that has a disproportionate impact on um, marginalized communities, on uh, racial, ethnic, religious minorities, or any other uh, constitutionally protected. Thank you very much. Uh I know we're running a bit over here, but before we go, we have a few audience questions. I'd like to package some of those together for our panelists to address in one shot. Uh, we have a question from Billy Easley, which is about whether FISA should be dissolved and replaced with congressional investigations and oversight instead. I think that was already addressed in response to board member Nitz's question. Uh, we have a question about um, whether, this is a legal question from anonymous attendee, uh, whether uh, Congress or the courts extending authority over surveillance under 12333 would infringe on the president's Article II powers. And then a question from Professor Peter Margulies asking whether intelligence uh, transparency and FISA court transparency 
have improved since Snowden and whether there's more room for improvement. So we'll just throw those to our two panelists for the final question as a package. Great, I'll, I'll jump in uh, real quickly on Peter's question. Uh, I think it's clear that both through formal means and shall we say informal means, transparency has ticked up quite a bit. Um, that's been sort of the define, as someone who has to teach this stuff and has to constantly uh, replace the syllabus because of the constant flow of new information, I'm, I'm quite confident transparency is uh, even greater now than it was in 2013. And in 2013, it was much more than it was 10 years earlier and so on down the line. On, um, on whether there should be an extension of a judicial role, as, as Liza suggested, um, into the 12333 realm and subjecting 12333 activity, which is a shorthand we use for, uh, for the realm of overseas focused activity that was not meant to be pulled into the FISA framework as it was originally conceived, would it present an Article II issue? It, it certainly presents an Article II issue that there, there's no doubt the president has Article II authority as an affirmative matter to engage in that surveillance. The question is, if that, if that authority is subjected to constraints in the form of judicial review, might that present a constitutional problem to a greater degree than, than, than the courts ultimately determined was the case with original FISA, which the courts ultimately have accepted as a constraint on, on what the president does in this space, even if there are those who still don't like that result. Um, and of course, that's, that, who knows how that would ultimately turn out in the end. But it does call to mind something that never gets mentioned in these debates because FISA kind of mooted the issue um, from 1978 onward. But if you go back to all the circuit court decisions of the 1970s and the early 80s, they were reflecting um, the debate as it stood before courts were blessing some of the domestically focused foreign intelligence activity. And the Fourth Amendment question would arise. And the question was, is there a foreign intelligence exception to the warrant requirement altogether, such that you didn't, strictly speaking, have to have FISA? The circuit courts in that era kept ruling that there was such an exception. The Supreme Court never said it. Um, but that issue would, would lurk in the background in a lot of these discussions as one of the great unresolved issues that used to be talked about all the time. And for a full generation now, no one talks about it. I suspect probably the courts wouldn't go that way now because I think our culture has changed on these issues, but you never know. I think extension into the 12 triple three realm, conversely, uh, presents a real chance that, that there could be a strong Article II argument that might even win. Uh, sorry, Bobby, did you want to talk, address any of the other questions before I? No, no, that's good. Please. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there are potentially some aspects of, of 12 triple three surveillance that involve article two authorities of the president. But you have to remember that today, uh, surveillance under 12 triple three surveillance conducted abroad is pulling in Americans' communications in massive amounts. And that means that Americans' rights are very much at issue. And as the Supreme Court made crystal clear in the Guantanamo cases, when Americans' liberties and civil rights are at issue and civil liberties are at issue, there is undoubtedly a role for all three branches of government to play, the courts, Congress, and the president. So I don't think there would be any Article II uh, problem with Congress legislating, particularly to the extent that the legislation was focused on uh, the extent to which Americans' communications were being uh, pulled in. Um, on the foreign intelligence exception, just briefly, I just want to point out that the, the lower courts that decided these cases, now they were talking about cases in which the Americans were the target, uh, but they did say that the target had to be, in order for the exception to apply, the target had to be a foreign power, an agent of a foreign power. Um, we don't know how those courts would rule on, uh, you know, back then or today on a situation where the target is overseas, but an American's communications are collected. So it's hard to know what to do with that case law exactly. But as Bobby said, the Supreme Court has not recognized the exception. And then transparency, I mean, no question um, that we've had more of it um, in, the, in the last few years. That is a good thing. Um, it has not gone far enough at all. Uh, as I've mentioned more than once today, uh, we have no idea what types of information the government is collecting under se Section 215. And they may say things like, oh, you know, it's things like a store receipt. Well, what else? <laughs> and, it, and if you ask specifically, are you getting web browsing information? You're not going to get an answer. So we need that type of transparency. Uh, we saw some very significant FISA court opinions disclosed in October 2019 
um, where the first of those opinions had actually been uh, issued a year earlier. And it, it's not that it took a year to declassify it. It's pretty clear that uh, the idea was to wait until the appeal had run its course. And that way, because the government lost at the, at the lower court level in the, within the FISA court. And had the government been able to prevail on appeal, that would have provided a little bit of damage control when they made all of this public. Of course, they lost on appeal, and then and the damage was all the worse because it was clear that they were releasing it so late. Uh, we are not seeing the kind of full and robust transparency um, that ideally we would be seeing, although, and I don't want to diminish this, great progress has been made. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you to all of our panelists and to the audience for their questions. Uh, we're out of time, but I want to remind everyone that later this summer, we'll, we will be also posting written submissions uh, from many other FISA experts on our website. Uh, so best wishes to everyone for continued health, and thanks again for joining us today.